Welcome uh, to the second lecture intervention of uh, the project uh, We Build Our Languages Out of Rocks, Transpositional Geologies. Um, the project is a cooperation between Sascha Miklowait, the artist, and the Mineralogical Museum of the University of Bonn. And for today's lecture, I uh, welcome Professor Dr. Selby Hirth and uh, Dr. Kerry Robbins. I will briefly introduce them. Um, Dr. Robbins is an art historian appointed uh, as curator for art and artifacts in the Department of Special Collections um, at the Bryn Mauer <laughs> College, very difficult to pronounce for a German tongue, uh, near Philadelphia in Pennsylvania, USA. And she develops and organizes exhibitions, manages public publication projects, research and catalog arts, and partners with faculty and students to integrate collection objects into courses and programs. Um, Dr. Robbins advises and supervises students on a regular basis, often teaching curatorial seminars in the Department of History of Art or through the college's um, interdisciplinary 360-degree program. Um, Sally Hearth is a min mineralogist uh, at the same department. Um, her research examines geologic extraction legacies, including acid mine drainage from abundant coal mines and the intersections between human system and geologic knowledge production at colonial mine sites. She teaches courses on mineralogy, petrology, and the history of geology through the lens of Western colonialism. Much of her scholarship and teaching is centered on the Bryn Mauer Mineral Collection, which comprises about 40,000 specimens from around the world. The title of uh, today's lecture is, If you don't grow, you have to mine it. Geologists, knowledge production, and colonial legacies. And with this, I'm done. And welcome once again. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Oh, <laughs> I've never seen the tapping before. It's exciting. Uh, and thank you so much for Sasha for inviting us. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, so we're going to start with minerals, because that's what I love. Um, and we're going to start with the minerals involved in climate change. And whenever I tell students we're going to talk about the mineralogy of climate change, they give me blank stares. Uh, but the reality is that when we try to move the world off of fossil fuels, we're going to need new technologies, and those technologies are going to require minerals. Um, so, you know, lithium, cobalt, rare earth elements, acres of copper, um, we're going to require significant mineralogy in order to move these technologies forward. Um, and as my mineralogy professor told me over and over and over and over again, if you don't grow it, you have to mine it. All of these minerals are going to have to be mined. And so the coming mining shift of the next few decades is going to look at expanding mining in areas where we're already doing quite a lot of extraction, but also new mining endeavors like the lithium flats that are happening in, for example, Bolivia. And with all of this new mining is going to come the kind of mining conflicts that we have seen over the last few centuries um, involving, oh, I can make the slides advance, good, okay. Uh, involving conflicts over land rights, uh, water quality, mineral rights, labor. Um, and, and of course, in the middle of all of this is going to be our science, um, quantifying the effects of climate change, uh, figuring out where the minerals are, getting the minerals out of the ground, um, and the various conflicts that arise when you try to extract things out of the ground. Um, because of this, I think it's really important that we understand the historical context of our field, um, especially as it relates to uh, mineral extraction, knowledge production, and its relationships to human rights, you know, land, water, labor, uh, particularly within the context of Western colonialism. When we look at that history, um, it's, it's a deep and long history, and it goes back into the 1820s or so. Um, and there's a variety of themes that you can pull out. I'm only going to mention just a few of the biggest themes that you can pull out of the kind of relationship between geology and colonialism, because we only have six hours to do this. So um, <laughs> we've got to go fast. Um, one of the ones that we see is this uh, relationship of, of geologists, especially in like the 1820s, using 
colonial infrastructures to access field sites, right? Around the time of like starting in the 1820s, there was this explosion of exploration uh, by European powers, North American powers, Australian powers into these new lands. And these geologists very happily tagged along in order to access these exciting new rocks and exciting new fields. Um, so here's just three examples of the kinds of like tagging along uh, the geologists did, but they're, they're famous examples, you know, Darwin on the Beagle. Uh, the Beagle, I think has been portrayed as the scientific expedition. It was a military expedition that was sent to make nautical charts of South American coast in order to support the British informal empire and its economic relations in South America. It was not a scientific mission. The fact that Darwin was there was accident. Um, Dolomieu was on Napoleon's uh, invasion of Egypt. He brought students. He and his students followed along behind the French army, taking data, taking samples. Um, Edwin Long was on the, or sorry, Edwin James was on the Long expedition uh, into the American West. Um, I could go on and on. There's so many examples of uh, the ways that geologists could kind of ride the coattails of these military expeditions. Um, but they also led their own. Frequently, land that was being targeted for uh, colonization. Colonizing powers wanted to know what kind of mineral resources are there. And so they would send geologists in to do mapping of the landscape and also to characterize the mineralogic content. Is this exploitable? Um, so, you know, we're going to talk about one of the examples of that at SUMEB in this talk, but also, you know, John Wesley Powell, who um, popularized the Grand Canyon in the American West. Uh, it was a, it was a classic enduring example of this. He led many expeditions throughout the American West during the early period of colonization. They returned data, but they also returned intelligence. Um, a lot of these geologists understood themselves to be scouting for settlers and would return political intelligence, military intelligence, and crucially maps. Um, these maps became the tools that were used both in military conquest, but also in colonial administration. Um, so, for example, the, um, the Wheeler Survey of the American West produced a lot of these maps. Uh, the uh, Great Trigonometric Survey of India is another classic example. Um, so, in addition to maps and data and specimens, uh, geologists also didn't have to go to these lands sometimes in order to get this data. Uh, sometimes their friends who were on these military expeditions would send data back to them. Um, so like a classic example, um, Edward Seuss received a lot of data from colleagues that he had who went on military expeditions, uh, for example, through the East African Rift, and then would send data that they, you know, he had instructed them how to take back to him. And from that, he was able to assemble some of his uh, early tectonic theories. Um, and in addition to data, of course, people sent back specimens. Um, this is uh, one of my favorite examples, Arthur Holmes's 1911 radiometric age dating that dramatically pushed the age of the Earth back um, it was based on specimens from around the world, uh, but notably Ceylon. Uh, the Ceylon specimens, he, he didn't go to Ceylon and get them, he went to the museum in London, the Natural History Museum, where these Ceylon specimens had been sent uh, by the British Imperial Institute, by the British Imperial Institute mission. Um, anyway, these central repositories of specimens became important places where geologists could go and access specimens from a variety of different locations without having to go to all those places. And they're in our collections now. All of those specimens from that colonial era you know, came back and are now in our university collections, our you know, federal and museum collections. Um, and these legacies are still baked into our science. And so there's this question that is constantly haunting me of like, what do we do with these? What do we do with these specimens? What do we do with these legacies? Um, and in this talk, we'd like to talk about what we're doing um, to try to approach these questions. Um, the first strategy that we've been using is to use minerals as lenses, um, which is also something that you know, Sasha is doing in an artistic way. Um, we're going to talk about uh, at least two different specimens that we are using as lenses to focus our attention on these geocolonial relationships. Um, one from Sumeb and one from Shinkalobwe in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, and then the other strategy that we want to talk about is um, 
keeping geology within this wider context of knowledge production. So thinking about geology as a science as related to other fields that are also dealing with these questions. Um, so for part of this, we're gonna talk about student collaboration that we've been doing, um, but we're really gonna try to highlight the collaboration between me and Carrie. Um, I'm a mineralogist and Carrie is an art historian um, and you wouldn't think that this is a natural collaboration, but it turns out that our fields are wrestling with some of the same questions. And so looking at how Carrie is wrestling with institutional legacies and art and collections histories is really relevant to how I am trying to wrestle with mineral collection and geology legacies. Um, oh, that's what I just said. Carrie is going to talk about, sorry, past Selby and present Selby are in line. Um, Carrie's going to talk about uh, wrestling with legacies of institutional racism and exclusion at our college, Bryn Mawr, um, and I'm going to talk about colonial legacies in the mineral collection. Um, all right, so the plan for the talk, uh, we're going to start with Carrie. Uh, Carrie's going to talk about uh, the early work that she's been doing um, on Bryn Mawr College and our institutional legacies, uh, and then we're going to talk about the mineral collections and how those are relevant for minerals. Carrie's gonna talk about some of the methods that she's been using to try to curate these objects that have these complex legacies. And then we're gonna talk about how we're using those in the minerals. Carrie's gonna talk about the student collaborations. And then I'm gonna talk about one of the student collaborations that we've done on the minerals. That's our plan. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Selby. Thanks to you all for being here. Thanks to Sasha. So I'll just start with a, a, a brief introduction to our institution. Bryn Mawr College was established just outside Philadelphia in 1885 as a distinguished liberal arts college for women. It has boasted both undergraduate and graduate programs since then. The college's first dean, M. Carrie Thomas, was intent on proving that women had the same intellectual capacity as men. Her own challenges, attending classes or earning a degree motivated her to develop a curriculum with academic rigor for women at Bryn Mawr. She hired Florence Bascom, the first woman to earn a PhD in geology in the US, who went on to have a huge impact on the field. Locating our collections within the founding feminist principles of the institution is a source of pride for Selby and me, but of course it's also an overly simplified origin story. Between 1895 and 1922, the era of Thomas's presidency at the college, the institution blossomed into a hub for women's suffrage at the same time that Thomas actively blocked and rescinded admission to qualified African-American applicants and refused to hire Jewish faculty. So since 2020, I've been involved with an ongoing project on campus to revise the standard narrative of the college's history by asking who built Bryn Mawr through exhibitions of underrepresented narratives. Last summer's exhibition was organized with student interns and it looked closely at the physical evidence of the campus's built environment to discern the founders formative patriarchal and white supremacist ideologies. That exhibition argues that every aspect of the college's campus from the stones of its buildings to the height of its stairs was vigorously debated and consciously designed. The collections too represent this legacy. The materials in the college's collections were instruments of the specific kind of knowledge production pursued and endorsed in the founding of the college. An institution founded to educate women as part of a broader but segregated Quaker vision of social reform in the wake of the Civil War and Reconstruction. The founders aimed to produce students who conformed to ideal notions of femininity that demanded societal ideals of morality, refinement, and subordination to patriarchal authority on the one hand, and ambitions for unprecedented intellectual, physical, and professional achievement on the other. Objects were collected to cultivate a particular kind of learning environment. The college's 
first dean and second president, M. Carrie Thomas, led these efforts, selecting classical plaster casts and study photographs of Greco-Roman and European art and architecture for the teaching of art history, archaeology, and Greek and Roman classical traditions in ways that reinforced ideologies of white European and especially Anglo-Saxon superiority. Selby. Um, this understanding of like, oh, an institution's vision shapes how it collects uh, has been very useful for me as I've been trying to reckon with understanding this mineral collection. Um, when we look at the mineral collection, it was started by Florence Bascom, who is the founder of our department um, and who we're, we're very proud of her legacies. Um, and we still teach with her specimens. Hers were the earliest you know, material we had in the collection. And then every year, you know, every well, maybe not every year, every decade, um, every 50 years, every so often, we would increase the collection based on what we needed and what, what kind of donors were donating to us. And frequently donors would donate to us because they believed in the value of women's education and women in science. So this collection that we had of minerals was, was very much tied to the vision of the college. Um, it's also separated into the teaching collection that we teach with. Um, which I was placed in charge of when I took over because I was hired as the mineralogist and they said, cool, you're the mineralogist. Here's the teaching collection. You're going to teach with it. And I was like, awesome, because it's an amazing teaching collection. Um, all of the specimens in the teaching collection were selected because they're like perfect standard visions of everything. So if you want to teach about starolites, we have like buckets full of perfect starolites. You know, if you want to teach about like conchoidal fracture. It's like, great, here's the cabinet of conchoidal fracture. Just every single element that you could want. We have in like triplicate to 100 times what we need. Um, anyway, so I was curating this collection. I was super excited about it. Everything was great. But I knew there was this other collection, this other mineral collection somewhere in the building. Um, it was behind this locked door. Um, it's the Vox collection. And it is pronounced Vox, even though it's spelled Vo. They got anglicized. Um, anyway, the Vox collection, it was behind this locked door. I knew it was like full of special minerals, but I didn't know what was in there. It was run by this very distinguished professor who was much older and she ran it and I was brand new. And so I wasn't gonna like step on her toes until one day she walked into my office and she handed me the keys to the room and she said, I'm leaving, I'm done. And she left. And so that was my whole introduction to this collection. Um, so I went into this room for the first time to take over curation of this collection. I had no idea it was in it. And it's filled with these like old, like, you know, 19, like, late 19th century cherry wood cabinets. They're just so classically geology. And I start opening them up and like going through them. And they're just beyond spectacular. It's just like the most perfect minerals that I could ever hope to get to deal with. Like just beautiful crystallographic examples and like classic localities and like each locality, we have a whole suite from that locality and just like the most beautiful minerals that I could ever hope to suddenly be in charge of. Um, except that as I was going through the collection, I was also noticing their labels. So there's all these incredible minerals in these cabinets and they have labels. The teaching collection had labels, but not quite the same. Um, so this is, this is like a classic teaching collection label. It's like, here's the name of the mineral and the crystal system and the chemical class. And student, you should notice these features about the mineral. Like it's very, you know, for the students. But there's no location information. There's no information about what land this mineral came from. They're completely decontextualized and cut off from any histories. They're just abstract thought made into rock. The Vox collection has locations. Um, and there were locations I recognized. Uh, Rhodesia, um, Belgian Congo, French Congo, Ceylon. Um, obviously, these are colonial localities. So uh, initially, I was like, oh, man, we're going to have to update all these tags. Um, but then, then as, you, as you start to see enough of these, you realize not only are these colonial localities, but they're localities where the minerals themselves are 
like completely interwoven with the colonial histories. Um, you know, so a lot of these mineral localities motivated Western colonization of those sites. Um, so we have, you know, gold from the Sierra Nevadas that caused the gold rush that brought, you know, 300,000 settlers in a decade to San Francisco. Uh, this was the end of colonization in the American West. This was the nail in the coffin. What do we do with that gold? How do you curate those histories? Um, we have minerals from mine sites that funded Western colonialism. Uh, so Cerro Rico in Potosí in what is now Bolivia was the mountain of silver. Um, and for a big chunk of the Spanish empire, it provided 80% of the silver that the Spanish empire extracted from the new world. Like 80%, this mine by itself funded the Spanish empire. How do you, what do you, do you just put this on display with a tag that says Cerro Rico Potosí? That doesn't feel right or good. Um, we know that a lot of these minerals were extracted under extremely dangerous labor conditions. Mining is always dangerous labor, um, but colonial mine sites in particular um, had a disregard for labor safety that verged on, well, bad, very bad. Uh, we also know that a lot of these were extracted under coercive or forced labor systems, um, disproportionately by indigenous workers, workers of color. Um, this is just a, a short list of the kinds of large scale labor systems that are represented in our collection. Uh, Southwest Africa's contract labor system, the Belgian Congo's head tax system, Rhodesia's hut tax system. The Spanish empire had like a whole si set of systems associated with extracting labor from indigenous peoples. And then of course the Spanish and Portuguese brought over enslaved people from Africa to work new world mines. I think sometimes when we think about the transatlantic slave trade, we think exclusively about plantations, but you can see from this map, you know, I put a, a little box around all the mine sites that they were importing people to, to work. Um, forced labor was a huge component of colonial mining. Um, there's a lot of examples of this that I could give. I just wanna give one short like excerpt about one of these colonial mine systems because we only have, yeah, 10 or 13 hours to do this. Uh, but it's about the Belgian Congo uh, head tax system. And it's from a paper by Jane Siebert. And she writes, uh, if a plantation or mine in the Belgian Congo uh, required workers, it informed the colonial district officer who then adjusted local head taxes arbitrarily. Whoever was not able to pay the tax was immediately forced to sign up for compulsory labor. When you look at these large scale labor extraction systems, none of these are free labor. Even if they're falling short of slavery as a definition, this is not free labor. So what do we do with that? Uh, a lot of these minerals were extracted in conditions that left lasting environmental damage. Uh, so this is a, an incredible, just beautiful pyromorphite uh, from what was the Broken Hill Mine of Rhodesia and is now Kabwe in Zambia. Kabwe will be one of the most polluted sites on earth for forever. What do we do with that pyromorphite? Um, these extractions also cause lasting public health damage. Um, these are a set of uh, artistic interventions in the Colorado Plateau um, protesting uranium mine leftovers that are continuing to uh, poison public water sources. So I had just been handed keys to this room full of colonial minerals that had motivated colonial occupations, funded colonial occupations, and been extracted at extremely high cost to workers, the environment, public health, all of which were disproportionately borne by indigenous communities and people of color. And the question that's just haunting me is, oh my gosh, what do we do with this? Like, how do, we, how do you curate materials that have these legacies attached to them? which is about when I met Carrie, which thank God <laughs> I met Carrie. Anyway, I'm gonna turn over to Carrie. <laughs> so for each of us, our curatorial responsibilities began when we were handed the keys to storage rooms containing vast collections of things, things that had been accruing at the college ever since it had opened. Thomas's portrait by John Singer Sargent won a grand prize at the 1900 World's Fair in Paris. She furnished her on-campus home under the advice of importer-exporter Lockwood DeForest, 
and purchased many things deemed valuable or useful for teaching the object lessons of the 19th century. These included hundreds of 19th century and early 20th century study photographs of canonical works of art and architecture, as well as thousands of archeologically excavated ma materials. As curators of academic collections, we feel as much curatorial responsibility for our collections as we do a responsibility to our students. We've been displaying portraits in ways that seemed to celebrate the founders and donors without challenging the harmful costs of their legacies, advancing some at the expense of others, especially non-white, non-Christian women. When I arrived in my position as curator, the portrait of Thomas had been hanging for 15 years in the college's only gallery on campus. It was the only work of art to have continuous display in the space, and prior to that, it had hung in the main library's great hall for decades. In my first exhibition, a monographic exhibit of photographic portraits by the artist Chris Graves, I tried to address, rather than ignore, the large and forceful presence of Thomas's portrait in the room. I juxtaposed it with a new work of art I had purchased for the collection. That is, I placed the similarly large portrait of the artist's sister, Jessica, next to, but looking through, the painted portrait's competing gaze to greet the viewer upon entrance to the gallery. My label and catalog essay addressed the juxtaposition by accounting for the history of Thomas's racist exclusion of people who looked like Jessica, while the remainder of the space was realized in collaboration with the artist and his testament project narrative. For every subsequent exhibition, I recruited student curators into this exercise, asking them to juxtapose an object and write a label that accounted for the presence of Thomas's portrait and attempted to contextualize that painting in relation to the terms of their exhibits. But these interventions were not sufficient. How could they have been? They couldn't repair the institutional histories of racist harm. Students were calling for the institution to be transparent about this, and the continued display of this large and gilded painting was too readily perceived as a celebration or monument to its subject. It was a particular case study in which the artwork just needed to come down. And a student strike finally produced that result. Selby and I continue to seek out ways of recruiting students into the curatorial responsibility we feel for collections, a responsibility that includes addressing the legacies of colonialism and racism embedded in and enacted through them. One of the ways we try to do this is to center the stories of how and why materials entered collections, especially to scrutinize the colonial power relations that enabled this. Indeed, this has become a key strategy amid worldwide calls to decolonize museums. All museums are grappling with this massive paradigm shift. All right, so this banner is um, made for an art collection, um, but it's, it's really useful for minerals as well. We can ask the exact same questions. Uh, if you can read it, <laughs> I realize it's a little dark actually. How was this acquired? By whom, for whom, at whose cost? You can ask those same questions about art or museums or minerals in general. Um, so one of the techniques that we've been trying to use to uh, answer those questions for specimens in our collection is um, object biographies, where you attempt to trace the life of an object, starting from its excavation, coming out of the ground, its entrance into our collection, like how did it get into our collection? Did we purchase it? Was it donated? Was there a mineralogist who went there and you know, took it out of the ground. And then into our classrooms, how are we using it in teaching? How are we using it in scholarship? Um, how are we using it in informal education in museums? Um, articulating that life of a specimen can shed a lot of light on the various mechanisms that are happening. Um, so we did this initially with some azurite crystals from Sumeb in Namibia. Um, Sumeb is in the Otavi Mountains um, in kind of northeastern Namibia. Um, and it's, it's widely considered just an amazing mineral locality. Um, in 1977, the mineralogical record called it the world's greatest mineral locality. 
um, it has produced an incredible variety of mineral specimens of, of beautiful quality. Um, the Mineralogic Database lists it as, as the second most prolific type locality in the world. So um, 72 type minerals were described at Sumeb first, which is just an incredible number of minerals. And then you look at the number of mineral species that are present, 342 mineral species to be found at the Sumeb mine. Just like, it, incredibly diverse, mineralogically rich, amazing site. Um, when we do an object biography for these azurites, um, we see a lot of the kind of standard mineralogic geocolonial relationships illustrated. Um, Sumeb was very much a motivation for German colonization of this region. Um, it funded a lot of colonization. Um, these materials were used by local people prior to colonization, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, Actually, I'm gonna talk about a lot of these in a minute. <laughs> um, geologists were colonial scouts, just like we talked about. Um, they were extractive using coercive labor systems under dangerous labor conditions with long lasting environmental and public health outcomes. So it's, it's as a mineral, illustrates a lot of these themes that we're interested in getting more out of. Um, <coughs> one of the things that I've noticed about uh, all of these object biographies that we've attempted is that when you look up the histories of some of these sites, they're inevitably written from deeply colonialist perspectives that try to portray uh, mining and geologic exploration of these sites as this like steady march of Western progress in the face of what is otherwise indigenous chaos. Um, for example, Two of the quotes that I wanted to pull out, and this is just two of many that I could have pulled out about this site, um, spoke of the history of Sumeb as, quote, trouble with the natives. Um, and then this other quote uh, you know, starts out saying, there were constant problems with the native tribes who of course could not understand that their land now belonged to someone else. Um, so a lot of these early descriptions of um, the history of these mine sites are written with this expectation of Western progress um, and frequently even misspell the names of crucial indigenous people involved in the early histories um, or, or get wrong their affiliations. Um, so you can't just look up some of these site histories. It requires kind of a lot of digging, which is unfortunate. Um, another of the themes that's obvious in the Sumeb specimens is that these materials were being used by local people prior to colonization. Um, so there's abundant archeological evidence of copper excavation and smelting in central and Southern Africa generally for hundreds of years prior to colonization. And at Sumeb, at least since the 1850s, which is the earliest written records, the earliest written records of the Otavi region mention that the San and Ovambo people are using these materials, mining them, smelting them, trading them. Um, so this was, this was an actively mined site, even prior to the Westerners arriving. Um, and we see this throughout the mineral collection at Bryn Mawr and, and elsewhere. Um, these are some Amazonites that one of my students has been working with. Um, these Amazonites, they're beautiful Amazonites, um, but they were actively mined and used by the Ute Nation of Colorado uh, prior to uh, colonization. Um, ditto for the Katanga Copper Belt. We have a lot of Katanga specimens from you know, Central Africa. These materials were famously processed into you know, the Katanga crosses, for example. Um, all right, another of the th themes that Azure writes from Sumeb uh, illustrates really well um, is the concept of geologists as scouts. Um, the first organized Western expedition into the Sumeb area um, was by a geologist, was led by the geologist Matthew Rogers, who, although he was British himself, was working for uh, a British German uh, conglomerate, Swako, Southwest Africa Company. Um, this was interesting because at the time, the entire area had only recently been declared a German colony. Um, and German control didn't really extend beyond, you know, just the very edges of the coast. Most of the interior was still controlled by local um, people, local leaders. Um, and so the Rogers expedition had to navigate all of these pretty intensely political uh, alliances as they went, even though he was just a geologist, he wasn't like a diplomat or someone trained in any kind of negotiation. Um, he was still had to negotiate his way across all of these um, uh, international uh, difficult places, uh, controversies, international controversies. Um, 
while he was there, he was you know, charged with scouting the copper deposits to figure out, is this going to be a profitable place to mine? Um, and he did quite a lot of geology kind of on the way in addition to copper because he was a generalist um, and he was very interested in hydrology and uh, what, we, what we would call today structural geology. It's not what he called it, but that's what we would call it today. Um, during the time he was there, though, he clearly understood himself to be scouting for settlers. Um, his letters back to the SWACO board um, report back on soil quality, water availability, all of his advice for like what settlers should do once they got there. Um, his understanding of land rights and mineral rights, which were very much based in like Western understandings of land. Um, ominously, he talked about his opinions about using local people for labor. Um, and he included quite a lot of advice back to the Swaco board about how to subjugate the, uh, quote, stubborn and rebellious people of the territory. Uh, so he clearly understood that his remit was not just to scout the copper, but to scout future colonial advances. Um, despite that, and the, another theme that the uh, Rogers themes illustrates, he was completely dependent on his guides the entire time. Uh, he and his crew had to cross the central Namibian plateau, um, and the entire time they're crossing the plateau, you know, his African guides are keeping them alive every day by drilling for water, finding the water, um, finding them food, navigating them through the complex political territory of the local leaders. Um, and one of the things that you see is that he didn't even really know where the copper was. Um, throughout his letters, you see uh, him saying things like, well, thank you for giving me this map in London. It's useless. He didn't say it that way. He said, the small and only map supplied me in London is entirely useless for this work. Uh, at several points, he mentions that like, he wouldn't have been able to find the copper or the mines that were already there, but for bribing his guides to show him. And then several times throughout his letters, he writes things like, I can only follow whithersoever I am led. Um, you know, this was a person who would have died without his indigenous guides to show him where the copper was and keep him alive. So by doing an object biography on these azurite crystals, we're able to illustrate several of these interesting connections between early geology knowledge production and colonial relationships. Revising origin stories by producing object biographies is an incredible, rewarding, and useful way to address these histories. But doing so is also incredibly time consuming. Could we recruit students into the institutional work of accounting for these legacies of colonialism in our collections? In 2022, we conceived, planned, and taught a 360 cluster. A 360 cluster, course cluster, is a mechanism at Bryn Mawr for bringing together staff, faculty, and students across disciplines to examine issues that don't fit neatly into disciplinary boxes. We focused on the mineral collection. We taught two semester long courses. Selby led one on the history of geology through the lens of Western colonialism. And I partnered with our collections manager to teach one on cataloging geologic collections. The same 15 students from a variety of disciplinary backgrounds took both classes. We read extensively and discussed those readings, producing an annotated bibliography across topics related to colonialism in both geology and museum studies. We took a week long field trip to England to see how collections are approaching this question. The group met with curators at the Bristol Museum and Sedgwick Museum, met with archivists at the British Empire and Commonwealth collections, visited exhibits at the British Museum, Natural History Museum, Welcome Collection, Sedgwick Museum, Cambridge Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology, Bristol Museum, and Bristol Cathedral. Guest speakers, 
came to class via Zoom and in person. We spoke with science historians, museum curators, artists, activists. Each student chose a mine site from the Bryn Mawr College collection and produced a detailed site biography, reported on its colonial history, selected a specimen from that mine and wrote an object biography to report on its provenance. Collaboratively, the students repurposed Bryn Mawr's existing collections database, used currently for art and artifacts, to accommodate the mineral collections, while also designing a cataloging system for these materials that aim to avoid perpetuating colonial legacies. This small group, semester-long intensive collaboration produced some exciting ideas for moving forward with our collection including recommendations for structural changes to the Bryn Mawr cataloging system and inclusion of object biographies that will propel future research into the collection. All right, so these object biographies that our students produced were um, uh, an incredible contribution for us. Um, there were so many different geo-colonial themes that were represented in these, um, but there's one of these in particular that I want to talk about because one of our students, Maya Hofstetter, chose a mineral that doesn't exist in our collection anymore. Um, it's this empty box. Um, it was a uraninite, so a uranium bearing ore, um, from Shinkalobwe which is this you know, famous uranium mine in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, but used to be Belgian Congo. Um, of course, the reason it doesn't exist in our collection anymore is it's uraninite, it was highly radioactive, and the college was like, you can't keep this, <laughs> and so they had, to, they had to get rid of it. When we do an object biography for the uraninite from Shinkalobwe, it has a very similar trajectory, sort of, as the azurite. Um, so it was mined, we know it was mined between 1920 and 1930 uh, by Union Minière, which I know I pronounced wrong, Duhout Katanga, I get that wrong too, which I'll refer to as UMHK for obvious reasons. Um, in 1930, it was donated to Samuel Gordon, who was a mineralogist who was passing through the Central African region, collecting minerals for the Philadelphia Academy of Natural Sciences, so a museum institute that's still active in Philadelphia today. It was funded by George Vox, the collector whose collection we now have. Um, when he brought it back, the collection that he had made was split between the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences, and it still lives there today, and Bryn Mawr. Well, no, sorry, George Vox, and then George Vox's family donated it to us. It was used as a teaching tool, this, this uraninite. The uraninite was used as a teaching tool. They would never let us do that today. Um, from 1930, until about 2001, and in 2001, the college was like, you can't, you can't have this. This is, this is too radioactive. And they donated it to the US Department of Homeland Security, which is an anti-terrorism federal agency, so that they could use it for uh, practicing, identifying radioactive sources. Um, and after that, we have no idea. It disappeared into the federal government, it's gone now. Anyway, this object biography illustrates a lot of the same themes as the azurite we were looking at. Um, you know, the, the Shinkalobwe mine was originally a radium mine, which radium at that time was so rare and valuable that it was an incredibly rich mine for the Belgians. Um, we don't have evidence that uraninite or any of the material from Shinkalobwe was used prior to colonization, but the entire Katanga copper belt was. Um, again, geologists as colonial scouts, the labor systems, the environmental impact, all of these are still present for Shinkalobwe. But for Shinkalobwe, there, for this uraninite, there's several other themes that are very interesting that this lack of a mineral illustrates. Um, one of them is the important role that museum collections played in knowledge generation, uh, knowledge generation um, and also in kind of uh, opening up colonized land. Um, uh, Samuel Gordon was a mineralogist, but he was able to get access to all of these colonial minerals uh, because he was part of this organized museum expedition. Um, and we see this throughout the colonial era. These museums would send uh, expeditions throughout the world, collecting the entire world, bringing them back to Western institutions where they could be cataloged, assigned Western names, and then set into like our understanding of the world. Um, and so, yeah, we see 
we see a lot of these you know, expedition tags in our, in our catalogs. The other interesting theme that Shink, the, the uraninite from Shinkalobwe has been illustrating for us is the way you can use object biographies to trace mineral pathways through the world. And these have been fascinating. Um, in the, uh, one of the writings on object biographies by Samuel Alberti, Samuel Alberti, um, he asks, what makes this object different than other similar objects? And that is a really interesting question. You know, why did this uraninite end up with us and then later not with us? Um, where could it have gone? When we ask where could it have gone for Shinkalobwe, we have a lot of other possibilities. Oh, right, I was trying to show it could go other places. Anyway, there's the, it could go other places. One of the places it could have gone, uh, during the same time period, UMHK was mining uh, all of this uranium ore out of this mine. They sent an enormous amount of that ore to uh, Marie Curie um, for her radium experiments. So she would um, you know, process down huge amounts of uranium ore in order to get the tiny, tiny amounts of radium that were present for her experiments. And she was like slowly building up a radium collection. So it could easily have ended up there. It could also have been stockpiled. Most of the uranium ore that was produced during this time period at Shinkalobwe was just stuck in a pile because they didn't want it. It didn't have radium, they didn't want the uranium. Uh, and so they just piled it. And then eventually in 1940, the director of UMH, uh, UMHK heard about the weapons potential of uranium and kind of freaked out. He was like, well, I don't want this to fall into the hands of my enemies. And so he put it on a ship and he shipped it to New York, this, this 1,200 short tons of uranium ore. Those 1,200 short tons of uranium ore entered the Manhattan Project in the US. Um, where of course they got processed at a variety of sites throughout North America, um, and then eventually processed into the uranium that was used in the little boy bomb on Hiroshima and the fat man bomb in Nagasaki. Um, so our uraninite could easily have ended up in the pipeline for that as well. Um, alternatively, it could have ended up in the pipeline of the ultimately unsuccessful Germany or German nuclear weapons program. Um, a stockpile of Shinkalobwe ore had been at the Olen, am I pronouncing that wrong? Olen in Belgium, the Olen site, um, which was then captured by German forces in 1940 and then added to the, the German uh, nuclear weapons program. That material was probably captured by the US and eventually made its way into the little boy bomb, um, but that, that connection is a little more tenuous. Oh, sorry, that was your next slide. Um, anyway, by mapping the material flow um, and the possible different paths for these materials, um, we can see a lot of the relationships between museums, geologic knowledge production, and kind of the wider social and political forces that were happening globally at those times. So our students presented their work publicly to an audience that included artist in residence, Ellie Ga. I'd been working with Ellie since 2019 and had invited her to be in residence in the spring of 2020, just as the world shut down. So we postponed and postponed until finally she arrived in December of 2022. And as it happened in the closing weeks of our courses together, Ellie Ga is an American artist who lives in Sweden. Her interdisciplinary practice is based in institutional collections and collaborations. Her method takes its cue from activities like beachcombing, insofar as she embraces the uncertain and allows for chance encounters that help her see the past in that which makes itself present. Her artistic process involves extended periods of research including conversations with people in roles like curators, librarians, scholars, even Arctic explorers. Needless to say, she was the perfect artist to have around through all of lockdown. For the first year, we held virtual events with her so that she could become more familiar with our collections and we could get to know her. 
She was drawn particularly to archaeological materials and minerals. We asked her to join us in a teach-in, which is a program on campus that was developed by BIPOC students during the strike to provide an alternate form of education about race and equity. For this, she connected her current work to the work on the mineral displays that Selby and I were then undertaking. Her film Quarries, which was then in progress, was exploring histories of stone, transport, and invisible labor hidden in plain sight as the Calzada footprints and roads of Lisbon. Ga works somewhere between travelogue, diary, and visual essay. Her associations take the form of multi-channel videos, performances with live narration, books. In her work for the Whitney Biennial, Gyres, images reappear over the course of a 40-minute narrative. Each time they're retrieved from the screen, which she calls the beach, they come back with a slightly different significance so that the viewer begins to have a layered experience with the images. She says it's sort of like the ruins on the seabed, all these fragments, all the spaces between things. The absence has to be measured as well. Absences, ruins, <coughs> hauntings, all of these are embraced in God's practice. So when finally on campus with us, she found herself particularly captivated by our student Maya's presentation on Shinko Lobwe. Maya had been motivated to write this auto object biography or a specimen that was no longer present in the collection. And Ellie described this as a ghost record. Despite the loss of the physical object, Maya found an opportunity to write its biography. The loss of the physical object might imply the loss of our ability to curate with it. We, we want to suggest, however, thanks to Maya and Ellie, that these ghost records can be just as compelling as the objects themselves. Instead of confronting us with a mineral's physical and obdurate tangibility, the empty space confronts us with its mobility. They emphasize the flow of minerals out of mines through the hands of laborers and collectors, through laboratories and instruments, through tools and weapons, through ecosystems and bodies, and the large-scale forces that direct those flows. If we're, imagine, if we're to imagine our collections used differently in the future, it's useful to pay attention to these empty spaces. While in residence, Ellie also joined us for Selby's famous deep time walk in which she upends us non-geologists' conceptions of the world, history, time, across a several hundred meter walk on campus. Walking a now physical timeline from the point of the Earth's birth to its death, we witness the span of human presence reduced to the width of a strand of hair. We want to suggest that the ghost record for the mineral specimen can insinuate a similar temporal shift for the project of the museum. The loss of the physical object is the great fear behind the museum's mission to preserve, and it motivates its best practices for doing so. If ghost records can supplement lost objects, how might this contribute to so-called decolonization efforts within the museum? Or moreover, how might it help us reconceptualize the role of the museum? To conclude his 2013 essay on curatorial responsibility, Peter Ely issues this provocation. For now, we should feel emboldened to act as badly as we can justify and grateful if we can find people who still care enough about what we do to complain. Artists help us do this. <laughs> They embrace interdisciplinary approaches to problems that allow us to reframe and reimagine what is possible. Sasha Milkowite offers a transpositional geology that helps us ask otherwise unimaginable questions. Can I pulverize this mineral in the collection? Can I carve into the surface of this glass display case 
as if inscribing graffiti on a school desk? Can I compel visitors into a ritual reevaluation of a gravesite? Can we hijack the systems of display, the systems of the archive, even the systems of scientific classification to unveil the ways in which they quietly normalize mechanisms of power? If we hijack the formal containers of science, can we do so to smuggle additional forms of knowledge into them so that they cannot be ignored any longer? This is what our students started to ask. If we're thinking about how to catalog mineral specimens, can we think about how to record their human histories? Can we insert new categories into these systems, categories that can't always be filled in? Can doing so draw attention to the empty spaces so that the types of inquiry are exposed instead of reinforced as the supposedly neutral project of knowledge production? Can we document the collection so much that it antagonizes itself? Sasha and his exhibit here at the university embolden us to imagine our work as part of an epistemic bomb of a new classificatory system for geology. Thank you.